I thought I'd, I'd uh, title this teaching tonight, David Growing with God, because David really did grow with God. But I actually want to start in Romans 15, 4. And this is a verse I think that, that uh, many of us are very familiar with. And I want to just talk about it again, because I think it's important. Um, notice Romans 15, 4 says, for whatever was written previously, and of course, a lot of that Romans was written fairly early on in the New Testament period, probably about 53. Pentecost was probably about 28. Um, Galatians was probably about 49, uh, 48, 49, somewhere in there. So Romans was one of the earlier epistles. And so when it says, for whatever was written previously, the primary thing it would be talking about would be the Old Testament. And then it says, was written to teach us that through perseverance and through the encouragement of the scriptures. So here's the Bible and it says it was written to teach us. Well, it wasn't just written to teach us history. It does teach us history. But more importantly, it is through history that there are lessons that you and I take home. And that's really what we want to do. We want to read the Bible almost like you read a layer, you look at a layer cake. And, and the foundational layer is the, the facts of the case. What happened? What is the history? Because if you don't get that right, then you can't quite get the lesson that God's trying to teach you from it. So the, the first layer is let's, let's look, get the history down. And then we go in and we learn lessons from the history. What is God teaching us? And, and then through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we would have hope because there's certainly a number of encouraging things in the scripture. And then if we John 8, 32, and John 8, 32 is about the truth, but let's start in verse 31. And John 8, 31 says, then Jesus said to those Jews who had believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And there's a, a great truth to that, which is that it, it takes continuing in the word to let that word work in you through all kinds of different situations. Because to be a disciple, we want to be a 100% disciple. We don't want to be just a, a disciple when things are good in our lives. And, and if we continue in the word, then there are going to be times in our lives where things are really tough. You know, we're really up against some tough stuff. And, and we continue in the word in those situations. Then there are some times in the word and, and in life that things are pretty easy and things are easy going. And, and you learn how to handle those. You know, there's a lot of people that handle success well, but ha don't handle disaster well at all. And then there are other people that really seem to thrive when times are tough, but as soon as they're on top, <laughs> they, they can't hold their lives together. And so if, as we continue in the word, then we get to be a, a genuine disciple and be godly in every situation. And then it says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that's a, a, just a, a given that the truth sets you free. And one of the downsides of error is that um, error can produce confusion. It can misdirect, mislead. And so getting to the truth is, is very important. And the actual truth is, uh, frankly, um, the actual truth can be, can be difficult. Um, you know, it can be costly to get a hold of. But anyway, if, if we will just continue in the word and be Christ's disciples, and then we know the truth, and the, the truth then sets us free. And having said that, let's go uh, back to the life of David. And really, David's young life, we don't know much about it, don't need to. He was a, he was a shepherd. And one of the things we learn about the Bible is if if something is completely common and ordinary, then people really didn't write much about it. So shepherding life was pretty standard, pretty simple. You went out with the sheep, you watched over the sheep, you kept the sheep from falling off cliffs and doing stupid things because sometimes sheep are pretty unwise. You also protected the flock. 
Um, you made sure that they had grass, you made sure they had water, that kind of thing. So doesn't need to say much about uh, David as a young shepherd. Instead, we learn about the environment that David was in, and he was in an environment when Saul was king, and Saul was not a religious man, and by this time in his life, uh, Saul had developed a considerable amount of personal pride, and so, and we see this here in 1 Samuel 15, when Saul is supposed to kill the Amalekites, and he doesn't do it, and he makes a whole bunch of excuses as to why he doesn't do it, but verse 28 is going to be the operative verse here in 1 Samuel 15 for this teaching. It says, And Samuel said to him, said to Saul, Yahweh has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Now that prophecy is huge and it had been coming for a long time. You know, God is very patient with people. And he will put up with sin and he will put up with problems and all kinds of things. But if a person continues to harden their heart and continues to sin, it comes to a point where God can't really work with them for various reasons and he moves on. And that's what had happened here. And so God says, you know, I've, I've, he's torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day. Now, King. He, uh, so Saul was the king, and he's going to actually be king for probably another 15 or so years, maybe even a little more than 15 years um, from this point before he dies and loses the kingdom. And that is another lesson that we have to learn. If if for, if, for example, if you get a word of prophecy or you get a bump of revelation that you're supposed to be something or do something, it may be a, a while before you step into that role. And we've got to know that that's just something that comes up in God's economy, that our job is to just be faithful, to walk through the doors that are open sometimes to push a door open if we know we're supposed to get that way, but not to be impatient, but to be patient and pray like Doug Barker said earlier when we were sharing, you know, to pray for God's will to come to pass. Here, Samuel says, Saul, the kingdom is not yours. It's going to someone better than you. That sets the stage for Saul's mental position that he knows that someone better than him is coming to take the kingdom. So all of a sudden, there's going to be a shift in Saul. He no longer is secure in his kingship, but he's going to be suspicious of anyone who looks like they could take over the kingdom. And similarly, we go to 1 Samuel 16. And Samuel, of course, was aware of this. Saul, Samuel knew Saul's disposition. And here in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, Yahweh said to Samuel, and I believe this would be likely audible uh, revelation. I, I think literally God spoke to Samuel and said this, and we know uh, from other texts and stuff, and we know from personal testimony that God can speak in an audible voice to people. And I think that's exactly what happened here. Yahweh said to Samuel, how long are you going to mourn for Saul since I've rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, meaning Jesse lives in Bethlehem, for I have seen a king for myself among his sons. And when God says that, God looks on the heart. So God says, I've looked around and I've found a person, a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. Verse two, but Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul heals, hears it, he will kill me. Now think about that. Samuel was the one who anointed Saul to be king. Samuel had been Saul's faithful prophet. Samuel had spoken to Saul words of direction, words of correction. Samuel had been there to help Saul in his ministry and his kingdom since the very beginning before there even was a kingdom. But now what we're learning is that Saul's mindset had so shifted. He was so 
jealous that somebody might try to come and take the kingdom, that if he even heard that Samuel was going to go anoint someone else, that he would go and, and execute Samuel. Hard to believe. What are, okay, the, Romans 15, 4, what are we learning from this? Well, one of the things we're learning is that when, when people are jealous, they will do insane things. And we'll, we'll learn as we continue to read the record that they're, they're not stable. Um, and, you know, why is, why is God revealing this the way he is in the scripture? Because we can get sucked in by people and then really get hurt or really make a mistake. And what God is showing us is when, when people are holding on too tight to earthly things, when they're jealous, when they get demonized, which is, you know, afflicted by a demon, which is what happens to Saul, then you can't depend on what they say. They will change their mind in an instant. This is a lesson we learn. So basically what, what God does here is he tells Saul, I mean, he tells Samuel how to anoint David uh, without being killed by Saul. So verse 13, of course, Samuel then goes to Bethlehem. Uh, verse 13, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, that's David, in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of Yahweh rushed upon David from that day forward. Then Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And when it says, and that's, that's a very accurate translation. One of the things we've tried to do in the REV is to accurately represent the Hebrew text because when it comes to things of the spirit, we can't find them out by our five senses. And we can't feel it or guess it or whatever. You've got to learn and from the scripture. And when it says the spirit of Yahweh rushed upon David, Literally, that would tell you that, that God moved at that point in such a way that David could feel it. It, it, it made an impact. The spirit rushed upon him. And I, I'm looking around at the screen, looking at the 25 faces I see, and, and almost all of you, I can testify from talking to you that at times you have experienced that. You've experienced a time when you could say something or you could pray something or you could prophesy something or whatever, when you feel the spirit and you just know, and you just know that wasn't you. And, and that's exactly what's going on here. The spirit rushes on David from that day forward, and then David's going to go into Saul's service. So uh, chapter verse 14 of here in 1 Samuel 16, 14 now the spirit of Yahweh had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from Yahweh terrorized him. This is one of the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the spirit was upon people. It was conditional. It could come and go. Uh, in the New Testament, when we are born again of God's spirit, it is in us. It is permanent. Ephesians 5 says it's sealed until the day of redemption. So we are sealed with that spirit and we never have to worry about whether or not we're going to lose it. But here the spirit departed from Saul and an evil spirit from Yahweh terrorized him. And one of the things that, that when, when depending on the way a spirit acts in a human body, um, it can just simply give you thoughts or ideas or give you pictures or hallucinations, or it can go so far as to actually changing the physical appearance. But in any case, when Saul got this demon, his behavior and possibly even his physiognomy changed to the point that the people that were around Saul regularly could recognize it. Verse 15 then Saul's servants said to him, see now, an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. And then they said if he would listen to some calming music, that the effects of that spirit would probably leave, which it did. Now, I don't believe the spirit really left. I, I believe that generally when a spirit gains access to your mind or body, that it, it, it stays in there unless something dramatic happens in your life. You know, um, most of you know that 
for example, you can you can get born again and have enough word of God that the demon just simply leaves. Sometimes, like when and we see this in the life of Christ and the apostles, they cast demons out of somebody. But Saul was now afflicted by demons. Uh, the next chapter, chapter 17, we're all familiar with. Uh, David kills Goliath and begins to get a, get a reputation for himself. And so let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 18. By the way, in chapter 18 starts out with uh, after uh, David kills Goliath, that uh, Jonathan, Saul's son, uh, becomes very bonded to David, and they made a covenant together, verse 3. Verse 5, and David went out wherever Saul sent him and was successful. Now, this, you know... <laughs> You want to call this blissful in innocence, uh, youthful naivete. You know, David here is not suspecting Saul at this point. He's just happy to be in Saul's army. He's happy to be a powerful warrior. And he's going out and he's going to help Israel be successful against their enemies. The Philistines were a national enemy on the left, on the west, west coast. So he, David went out wherever Saul sent him and was successful. So Saul set him over the men of war because he was a fabulous tactician that shows up throughout his life. And it was good in the eyes of all the people and also in the eyes of Saul's servant, servants. And by the way, um, I, I was thrown off by the servants thing for, for a, a many years as a young student of the Testament because uh, in in my way of thinking, you know, my Western way of thinking is servant, you know, was like a household servant. They were like a maid or a butler or something like that. But in the it, it's it's learning the biblical idiom in the biblical culture, which was a a very stratified culture. The king was at was the top, and everybody under him was a servant. So his generals were servants, his, his army was servants, his officials were servants. And the people reading the Bible who lived in the biblical culture really understood that. And they understood you had to sort out the context to figure out who the servants are. Because sometimes the servants really are servants. They're just household servants. But a lot of times the servant is like the crown prince you know, or, or some of the top generals. And, and here, when it says that what David did was good in the eyes of the people and also in the eyes of Saul's servants, it means that here's, he's, he's doing army stuff. So in that context, the servants are your top army men, you know, your generals and your admirals and, you know, and, and that type of people. And so the fact that, you know, if in that culture, when you fought, you you know, you, you've got an army coming at you with swords. You've got your ar army. You're going at them with swords. You're engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat, very close quarter battle. And you, you, the goal was to leave the battlefield alive. And if David was such a good tactician that people were winning consistently and the, 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 the men, the army men and the, the, the officers and stuff were not only alive, but were successful, and they saw that David was doing this, they're going to get behind it. And so Saul's, even Saul's servants said, wow, you know, we really like David when he leads. You know, he's such a tactician. We just, we just win. So they loved it. Verse 6, and it came to pass upon their coming back when David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine. Cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. And that would be typical in the culture. Um, verse 7, the celebrating women answered one another and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Verse 8, but Saul was very angry at this saying, uh, and this saying was evil in his eyes. And he said, they've ascribed to David tens of thousands, but to me they've ascribed only thousands. What more can he have but the kingship? Why would he be thinking that? David doesn't want the kingship. David's happy to be a faithful servant. Why is Saul thinking, what more could he want but the kingship? Because Samuel had said, 
God's tearing the kingdom from you and he's going to give it to someone better than you. And so now Saul's looking out and saying, who could step into that role? And here come the women singing this. And now Saul is going to get all disturbed by that. And it's it's uh, going to do, going to uh, per pervert the way Saul sees David. Okay, back to Romans fifteen four. The scripture is written for our learning. See, sometimes we know who's thinking evil about us because they can't seem to be around us peaceably. They're always sniping or undercutting us or you know doing something to. That, that makes life difficult. But there's other people who are just nice and, you know, kind of sticky sweet, but behind the scenes, they're saying things and tearing down your work. And that's, that's where, that's what's going on here. We're still at the point where what's going on with Saul is going, going on behind the scenes. David is completely unaware of it. That this kind of thing happens in life, and it's one of the reasons that Proverbs says wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, because we've got to be wise when it comes to personal interactions. So 9 says, and Saul, I, and Saul eyed David from that day forward, means that he kept an eye on him, a jealous eye, if you will. Verse 10. It came to pass on the next day that an evil spirit from God rushed upon Saul. Now, I don't believe that the spirit was outside of Saul and then rushed into him. The, the, an evil spirit had moved into Saul years before, probably years before, back in chapter 16. Now we're in chapter 18. And so when it says the evil spirit from God rushed upon Saul, What's it talking about? It's talking about the that that influence that can be felt. It's just uh, Saul sitting there, and all of a sudden, Saul just flares with anger. You know, and you can see this in a number of people. Psychologists see this, especially like people that are alcoholics, people that are drug addicts. You know, they'll calm down for a while and then for what seems like no reason at all, they're just in a complete rage or they're completely out of their mind. And that's the way spirits work. And what a spirit really wants to do is it wants to hide behind a natural attribute. So take somebody who is has a lot of alcohol and tends to get angry. They have a tendency to get angry. And the Bible is guiding us to get control of our emotions, to not be unreasonably angry, that kind of thing. Remember Ephesians, be angry, but don't sin. You know, so the Bible is guiding us to get a hold of our emotions. But here's a person who doesn't, and they, they get angry, and then they're like, oh, I'm really sorry, and whatever. And if a spirit of anger gets in there, what it's going to do is it's going to hide behind that natural anger and it's going to uh, intensify it. So the person gets much more angry, uncontrollably angry at things that ordinarily wouldn't set him off. But the people around her are ignorant of the influence of the demon and they just say, wow, you've really gotten worse in your anger. And they, they don't get what, what actually happened. It's like the difference between a drunk and an alcoholic. You know, a drunk is somebody who drinks wine or beer or whatever it happens to be until he's drunk, you know. But an alcoholic is somebody that then all of a sudden they can't stop. They have no control. It's like, well, what happened to their control? You know, somebody, some a normal person at least has enough, you know, wherewithal they can stop. What changed in a person to where all of a sudden they can't stop? That's where the, the demon hops in. And psychologists will tell you, we don't really know why some people stay drunks and some people actually become full-blown alcoholics. Well, the reason they don't know is because you can't see demons. If you could see the demon, you could see when they enter and when they influence people. And this is, this is Saul. He had this demon and it rushed upon him. Um, and, he, and it says, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. We have no idea what he said. 
but I'm sure it wasn't exactly good. David was playing the harp with his hand as he did day by day. Saul had a spear in his hand and Saul threw the spear where he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped from his presence twice. So David was a good military man, avoided the spear. But obviously what was going on there was there was a demon that wanted to kill David. Why? Because the devil didn't want to face David either. Saul didn't want to be replaced. But the devil is really, really happy when there's evil, wow, when there's evil, ungodly leadership in, in, you know, in an organization or in a country or in a military or whatever, and he, the devil will work behind the scenes to get his ungodly people into leadership positions. And so David escaped, and verse 12 says, and Saul was afraid of David. Did, did he need to be? No. Where's, where's that coming from? Oh, it's coming from his pride, for one thing, because if he heard from Samuel that God took the kingdom from him and was going to give it to somebody else, if he was going to be obedient, he would say, okay, God, how can I facilitate this? How can I make this happen? But instead, he's thinking, how can I prevent it from happening? And he's not, again, we see uh, demonized people People afflicted by demons don't think rationally. Let's say Saul did kill David. Is that going to make the prophecy of Samuel go away? No. <laughs> God's going to simply have somebody else. You know, and so, so there's, a, there's not only a spirit of murder here, but there's just incredible irrational thinking. Okay, what are we learning from this? Well, we learn that when we're, you know, when you're dealing with people who are they're, they're uh, afflicted by demons, and that may show up as some kind of addiction, sex addiction, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, you know, uh, whatever kind of addiction. That's one way it shows up. Um, uh, out of control emotions is another way things can show up, uh, that type of thing. You know, when you're dealing with that kind of person, then you, you can't rely on what they're going to do because they're not stable and it shows up here and so Saul is afraid of David because Yahweh was with him and it departed from Saul no actual logical reason to be afraid of David because of that but that's that came out of that jealousy and pride within Saul so verse 13 so Saul removed him from his presence and made him his commander over a thousand and David went out and came in before the people and you know, David, as you know, is going to be a very popular king. And here's part of the reason why. He came, he, he says he went out and came in before the people. And that is an idiom. A, a, it's a Hebrewism, if you will. To go out was to leave your house or your tent in the morning. And to come in is to come back in to your house or your tent at night. And you're living your life where everybody can see it. And it's the same thing with you and I. If we want people to trust us, if we want people to feel good about us, we need to live our lives enough out in the open that people feel like they know us. And not that we have some you know, secret hidden life that people don't understand. David and, and David wasn't doing this because he was trying to take over the kingdom. David was doing this because this was David. And when, if you read the whole record of David, you see this kind of thing show up again and again. But it's a great model for you and I to learn from, that we want to be open with people, uh, reveal ourselves to people, not be, not be hidden so that people come to trust us. Verse 14, David was successful in all his activities because Yahweh was with him. What does that mean? It means David was walking by the Spirit. David was listening to Yahweh, making good decisions. And like I say, he was a master tactician. And so he was successful. Verse 15, when Saul saw that he was very successful, he was even more afraid of him. And the word for afraid in verse 12 and the word for afraid in verse 15 are different. And the word in verse 15 is a more intense word. It can actually mean to dread that Saul dreaded David. He just, he was, he was very, and it has nothing to do with reality. 
It's totally made up in Saul's mind. It was David was not going to kill Saul, even when David had a chance to kill Saul. And frankly, you know, some people would say he should have killed Saul. He didn't kill Saul. So this is, has nothing to do with David. It's all about Saul. We can run into these situations in life where you're like, you're kind of scratching your head about somebody. I just don't get them. And it's not about you. And if it's not about you, don't own it. It's about somebody else. And then we do exactly what Doug Barker said earlier. We pray and pray and pray and pray. And we, you know, we, we see if we can break through with prayer. And so Saul here is even more afraid. Verse 16, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Why did they love him? Because they saw him. They knew him. They understood him. They talked with him. He was there with them. You know, he, he wasn't, you know, pulled back in his little cubby where nobody got to talk to him. And so it's, I think it's a very powerful lesson that all Israel and Judah loved David because he was out there where they could see him and fellowship with him. So one, one of the things we see here in this kind of a, it's almost like a ladder of progression starting in early in chapter 18 and, and going through the, the rest of the chapter where David becomes more and more and more and more successful and Saul becomes more and more and more and more afraid. And David's success is due to the fact that David's obeying God, being godly, being out in front of the people. And Saul's fear is due to the fact that he's not dealing with reality and, and, and is doing exactly the reason he lost the kingdom in the first place. He was prideful and disobedient. And here he is being prideful and disobedient. And just the circumstances of life are forcing him to be more that way and more that way and more that way. So now we go to verse 17 and we see now uh, uh, Saul's going to try to trick David. It says, Saul said to David, here's my oldest daughter, Merib. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be a son of valor for me and fight Yahweh's battles. For Saul said to himself, let not my hand be on him but let the hand of the Philistines be on him. Now, David, at that point, doesn't say whether he loved Merib or whether he wanted that honor or not, but I'm sure he was, he was glad to have it. Um, but verse 18, David, who's quite humble, said to Saul, who am I and who are my living relatives, my father's clan in Israel, that I should become son-in-law to the king? Verse 19, but at the time for giving Merib, Saul's daughter, to David, she was given to Adriel, the Maholothite, as a wife. And that's a trick of the devil. You know, we know that Proverbs says that a hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so here you have Saul who says, you can marry my daughter. David was probably expecting that, looking forward to that. And at the last second, it gets pulled away. One of the things we see here is that David doesn't lose his cool about that. David, David doesn't crash and burn over that. And that's a great lesson for us, you know, because sometimes we're expecting something, we want something good to happen, we're thinking something good's going to happen, and then it doesn't. And those can be very hard times for people where they, you know, they just go into a period of depression, they kind of crash and burn. And, and one of the tricks of the adversary is to promise you something, promise you something, and then pull it away. And, and he tried that on David right here. And one of the things that we see is, is David, for his part, managed to keep his cool and, uh, and stay, you know, godly, which is, you know, a powerful thing. Uh, verse 20, verse 20, we go on, but Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the matter was good in his eyes. Verse 21, and Saul thought to himself, I will give her to him so that she will be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines will be against him. So Saul said to David, through the second one, you can this day be my son-in-law. So Saul here again, he's being underhanded. He's being sneaky. He's being dishonest. He wants to kill David, but he, he wants it to kind of be hidden. And then so they, they go through this marriage contract and uh, and David, in the end, basically um, marries 
David marries Michael. Um, verse 27, Saul gave him Michael as his wife. Verse 28, Saul saw and knew that Yahweh was with David, and Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul became even more afraid of David, and Saul was hostile toward David continually. So this is another step down the ladder. Saul becomes afraid. Saul becomes even more afraid. Saul becomes now, if it's possible, even more and more afraid of David. Meanwhile, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's totally in his mind. He's totally made it up. He's completely tormented and consumed by this. And it's all make-believe. It's all in his mind. And that can happen in our lives too, both ways. It can happen to us over something and we've got to you know, we've got to guard against that. And it's one of the reasons we want to have people that speak honestly into our life, you know, and, and we'll say, hey, you know, you're you're obsessing over this. Let go of this. This isn't good for you. You know, let it go. Move on. That kind of thing. People that really speak honestly into your life. And then similarly, that, that we are aware of it in other people. And so we can we can watch out for it or even help those other people. And then in verse 30, we see the continued ladder, the upward ladder of David. The commanders of the Philistines went out to battle, and it was as often as they went out that <laughs> David was more successful than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed. So, so Samuel or Saul is going downhill. David is, is going uphill. So now we go to chapter 19, verse 1. And at this point, there's... Um, you know, there's a, a a real a real break because Saul had been sort of underhanded, but now, verse one, Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan now intercedes for David. And if you look at verse six, Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore. As Yahweh lives, he will not be put to death. So in verse 1, he tells everybody, I want you to go out, find David, and kill him. By verse 6, it's like, well, okay, I won't put him to death. But then watch what happens. In verse 8, and there was war again. So David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them down with a great slaughter, and they fled before him. So what's Saul seeing? Now Saul's back into this thinking that here's David and he's being so successful. And he and Saul knows <clears throat> I'm going to lose the kingdom to someone better than me. And because of that thinking, verse 9, but an evil spirit from Yahweh came upon Saul as he sat in his house with a spear in his hand. David was playing with his harp in his hand and Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear but he escaped from the presence of Saul. So here Saul had kind of made peace in his mind. Okay, I'm not going to kill David. Things are going to be fine. But then as soon as David is successful, that fires up Saul's jealousy. The spirit moves in and bang, now Saul wants to murder David. And so you see this kind of thing going back and forth and back and forth. And I believe that the demon was in him all the time. And one of the things when it says, and I'm going to I'm going to close here. I want to show you some New Testament stuff. But um, when uh, it says, let's see, um, verse nine, the evil spirit from Yahweh came upon Saul. It doesn't mean that the spirit wasn't in Saul, and all of a sudden it hopped in. The spirit was in Saul from chapter sixteen. But it's just there are different times when it has the, because of the way Saul is thinking, it has the opportunity to really move and influence the way Saul is thinking and acting. We get the same thing in the New Testament. Uh, let's go to, to Luke 141. Because I was confused by this for a long time and tried to work to put this thing together. And finally it came together for me because um, when the Bible talks about being filled with Holy Spirit, for people that, that already have the Spirit, it doesn't mean that somehow or other they're now filled with Spirit. They were filled with Spirit. 
it's it's a biblical idiom, if you will. It's a way of expressing in the text that the spirit of God is working, just like the evil spirit rushed upon Saul. It didn't mean the spirit wasn't there. It had been there for years. But now it rushed on him, took hold of his mind or his body in a way that it, it had an opportunity to do due to Saul's thinking or what he was going through at the time. Same thing is true of Holy Spirit. So here we have Mary and Elizabeth. And in verse 39, it says, in those days, Mary got up, went in haste to the hill country because Mary's pregnant. Verse 40, she goes into the house of Zechariah, greets Elizabeth. Verse 41, it came to pass when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and cried out with a loud voice. Now, is that that here's Elizabeth, this godly woman. Was she not filled with Holy Spirit before? Yeah, she had Holy Spirit before. It was Old Testament Holy Spirit. It was upon her. But it's not like Elizabeth didn't have Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, in that very moment, she got the gift of Holy Spirit and it filled her up. That's not what it's saying. Elizabeth had spirit, and now it, it filled her to the point where she prophesied. It's a way of saying the spirit is giving her those words or impelling her in that way that she can prophesy. And this is standard New Testament language. Let's go still in Luke chapter 1. Uh, let's go to uh, verse 67. And this is this is Zechariah. So, um, you know, Zechariah now hears about, you know, the prophecies and John the Baptist and John the Baptist is born and he just was able to speak. Uh, he wrote his name is, is John. And, and all of a sudden, you know, as soon as he wrote his name is John, verse 67 says the father Zechariah was filled with Holy Spirit. Does it mean that he didn't have Holy Spirit before? No, it means that the Holy Spirit now in, that's been inside him is now impelling him, propelling him, influencing him, if you will, in a new way. And he's filled with Holy Spirit and he prophesied saying, and then it goes on to his prophecy. And we see the same kind of thing after Pentecost. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 4, um, this is the apostles, and they're being dragged before the Sanhedrin. Um, and in verse 7, it says, And when they, the Sanhedrin, had placed them, the disciples or the apostles, if you will, in their midst, they inquired, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with Holy Spirit. Is that telling us that Peter got born again right then? No, not at all. Peter's been born again. Peter's been born again since Acts chapter 2 when they got the Spirit inside poured out from Jesus Christ. So what does it mean then when it says, then Peter filled with Holy Spirit said to them, it's telling you that he's giving word of prophecy, that the Spirit now is, is impelling him, propelling him, filling him in a, in a fullness. And so now this becomes something that's worth sorting out because when we're born again, we're filled with Holy Spirit, but it's a different filling than this, and it's not a different word. It's a different context. It's just like the word, uh, well, a lot of the other words that we deal with, like the word servant in the Old Testament. It's the context that tells you what kind of servant it really is. So here, filled with the Holy Spirit, that's what that's talking about. Look, verse 31, Acts 31, the disciples uh, prayed for boldness, verse 31, and when they had implored God, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. When it says they were all filled with Holy Spirit, does that mean they got born again? No, they had been born again. This is a different use, different context of filled with Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit now impelling them, if you will, you feel that that pressure, if you will, where you know you're supposed to say something, God's feeding you the words, that kind of thing, and they were filled with Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness, meaning they're speaking by revelation, if you will, and speaking that way. Um, last one, let's go to Acts chapter 13, verse 9, and this is 
Saul and he and Barnabas are on the island of Cyprus, and they're they're speaking to uh, the the uh, proconsul there, a guy named Sergius Paulus, and he's got a right hand man who happens to be a sorcerer, <laughs> a man named Elymas, who is trying to distort and pervert uh, the, the truth of God. And then um, let's see, uh, verse nine says, but Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, oh, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and wickedness, you enemy of all righteousness, Will you never stop making the crooked paths, the, the making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now look, and, and Saul goes on. Did, could Saul have known that by his five senses? No. So when it says Saul filled with Holy Spirit, it's not talking about the fact that Saul was born again. It's talking about the fact that uh, that he was filled in a way that the Holy Spirit now was moving him, giving him words to speak and giving him revelation and that kind of thing. And I can remember as a young Christian being so, you know, wondering how, how all of this worked, but that's exactly how it works. So it's the same thing in the Old Testament and in the New Testament it works the same way with demons as with God. Person who has demons, the demon can sit there and wait for an opportune moment when it can move in the person. And then like Saul, all of a sudden, they throw a spear at you and they're going to kill you. Or they say something that just cuts you to the quick. Same thing with us. We can have the gift of Holy Spirit inside us. And it, it's not that it's dormant because it's always trying to reproduce its own nature in us. But uh, but we don't have a word of prophecy or we're not in, you know, imparting power when we minister healing or something like that. And then God moves, we move, and then power is manifested. And it's called filled with Holy Spirit. And if we can get that straight, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, but with demons and the Spirit of God, it will help us understand the lessons we're trying to learn from the Scripture. So I wanted to share with you that stuff tonight about David, because I think that in these end times, uh, there are going to be more people who are less controlled, or maybe I should say more people who are more out of control, um, and we need to be aware of it. We need to know how to control ourselves in difficult situations, and we know how to know, need to learn how to deal with people who are out of control themselves and what we can and can't expect from them. So thank you for being with me tonight.